So we have Matthew, who's a founder at Zinex Machinia, sorry, CEO, and Mia, who's a founding partner of the organization. Um, so without further delay, I will give it to you, Matthew and Mia. We're very excited to uh, join you virtually for Agile India this time around. Hopefully we can um, see you all in person next time. But essentially we want to talk about how metrics are really important to drive business agility. And we've looked at a lot of the metrics you use in psychology to actually form how we think about business agility and behavioural change. Uh, the metrics-driven approach that we're going to talk about today, we've actually used with a number of our customers. Um, we've got a wide range of different customers that we're working with at the moment, um, a lot of commercial ones as well as government agencies. So to start off, we'd really like to understand how you currently measure agility. So if you can go uh, using your smartphones to www w.menti.com and if you key in the code there there's free text there for you to give us an idea of the sort of things you're using to measure agility now so that menti meter is now open and it'd be really great if everyone could um, use their smartphones and give us some feedback we've got the usual ones on budget on time we've also got velocity See what else we come up with. Okay, counting stories. Starting to see some value delivered, performance, key results, outcomes. Lots and lots of things, lead time, some really great metrics coming through now. That's fantastic. Now, it's really interesting that outcomes is coming up as quite a big one, as well as velocity and stories. Because what we want to talk about today is very much looking at, let's look at not just the activities we're doing in when measuring agility, but let's look at the outcomes. And the best way that we can look at that is to look at the behaviours. So a lot of the things you've got there about outcomes and value, and team happiness, are the sort of things we were looking at. Because traditionally, when people are thinking about how do they measure agility, they think about velocity, how many stories do I do, and is it on budget? Because they've been our traditional activity metrics that we've used in project management. As we move into agile product management, we want to look at how do we measure our agility in a different way. This was the question that was posed to us quite recently by a client um, who uh, involved in Great Barrier Reef in Australia. They looked at some of our, um, uh, our outcome impact metrics from our other clients, um, including moving one organisation from a 220 day lead time to as little as four weeks. And they said, well, how is it that we can track uh, whether or not we're on, um, on track to be able to achieve that kind of outcome if we go down, down this path? So we had some conversations around um, how to, how, what kind of measures can we put in place? Can we, how can we predict, how can we use behaviour to predict those kinds of outcomes? And importantly, as we started to see them, how could we encourage them? How could we encourage those behaviours so that we could actually help our client to get to this kind of, of outcome? Because most of the time, as, as you've seen, a lot of our, our metrics typically don't come from behaviour, they come from descriptive analytics. And those are things like activity, velocity, and efficiency metrics. This tells us what has happened, but it won't tell us things like, why are some teams more successful than others? Why, why are some teams, um, uh, what actually makes those teams agile? And importantly, the things, the antecedents that create agility, how do we understand and then measure them to actually make them repeatable? To answer these questions, we need a different set of metrics. We need data analytics. Mm -hmm. Importantly, we need things like diagnostics and predictive analytics, as well as prescriptive analytics. Key to this is understanding behaviour from a, st a statistical perspective, having statistical models, not simple, simple correlation of oh, if, if we have improvements in velocity, this release, this creates improvements in agility, because human behaviour is really complex. 
To answer our approach, I've got to take you back nearly two decades when I was doing my postgraduate work in the John Hunter Hospital in, uh, in Sydney, just north of, of Sydney. And the team that I was working with had psychologists, occupational therapists, and speech pathologists. And our team would look at behaviour from, from their specific discipline. We looked at verbal comprehension, working memory, perception, processing speed. We looked at behavioural traits attached to those. And from that, we're able to predict developmental issues, ADHD, autism, things like that. This is exactly the same kind of approach that the FBI has used for nearly 50 years. It, it takes, that they take experts, they look at behaviours, they classify those behaviours, they use those behaviours to reconstruct time scene, um, crime scenes in order to start to identify what they think are the signature motivators. That helps create a profile that then helps to predict the, the behaviour of, of criminals in the future. It's exactly the same kind of approach that, um, that any kind of behavioural measures use based on particular types of influences. When people see a particular, a particular motivator, they've got different options. Choosing a particular option creates an experience and the experience itself influences behaviour. So part of our question uh, was, as we started to approach things from a psychological, psychological perspective and understanding behavioural analytics and data, data analytics was how do we take this model in order and understand business agility? So nearly 10, 10 years ago now, this is the basis of the model that we took. We didn't choose self-assessments. We didn't ask teams themselves to self-report because that's prone to cognitive bias, including Dunning-Kruger effects. So instead we took experts, they did things like naturalistic observation, diary studies, and contextual inquiries. We took um, a whole range of potential behaviours from their manifesto, Scrum Guide, Lean Kanban, even Management 3.0 systems thinking and extreme programming. We started off with 85 questions and we looked at the strength of our observed behaviours against the, those areas and looked at them in the context of enterprise outcomes in relation to productivity, cost savings, both capital and operational, as well as risk profile delivery. For those of you who are interested, uh, 10 years of data collection over 30 organisations, large and small, over 500 teams, some of which we actually looked at across time. So not just a single snapshot, but continually observe those and collect them. Some uh, every month, some teams actually every quarter. Um, we looked at software and non-software teams, so not just software development, but HR, marketing, finance, change management, even executive and middle management. Um, and for those of you who are data nerds, longitudinal principal components analysis with a very max transformation, that's what we did. And importantly, we looked at Anavar in relation to interactive reliability. We also did some, um, some post hoc analysis on, on the questions to see which questions actually weren't contributing any, any real significant um, and you this to the data models. And we started to remove them in order to come up with our, our final data model, which is this. The data model saw four main behaviours emerge, and these were um, provided the, um, the most significant perspective into enterprise outcomes for business agility. And the model explains 85% of the variance we saw in behaviour. These four key behaviours are this. Number one, self-organisation it made up 50% of the model. Self-organisation breaking down into things like managing products with agility, clear structure, goal clarity, working in small batches, dependability in relation to people being able to, to rely on each other in the team context for delivery. We saw agile values come out as the second strongest behaviour, things like empiricism, self-improvement, decentralised decision-making, shared purpose and leadership connectedness, et cetera. 10% of the model, and this kind of surprised a number of our colleagues, only 10% of the model is about sprinting, the structure of um, sprint planning, daily scrum, et cetera. That only makes up 10% of the model because self-organisation and agile values comprises quite a significant amount. And the last 5% around continuous learning culture. The last 15% of the model We've been able to, we've been doing some analysis since then over the last two years. Um, we found that a number of those things um, in relation to agility 
are unique to the organizational context and the culture itself. Things like their symbols, behaviors, their own attitudes and rituals, essentially their organizational culture. And this particular model we call Agile IQ. How does it work? Well, basically we take a team profile, we, we record a couple of behavioral observations against the team. Um, we've got so about uh, half a dozen archetypal, archetypal behaviors that help us, including the, the, either the Agile framework or the scaling framework that they use, we record that. We also look at the assessor's profile, essentially whether, what kinds of certifications they, they have, and importantly, how long that they've had those certifications. Because we found that assessors that only had a CSM, for example, that's over 10 years old, now, the Scrum Guide's changed a lot since, since then. So that formed part of our model. And the third element was the, um, the questions themselves. Those get fed into the data model. The data model then, it, it's not about you collecting an individual team's uh, data over time and you know, how many points, because you can compare the team's data immediately to um, the strength of those behaviours that, 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 that I showed you, um, their agile maturity stage, which I'll show in just a sec. A comparison of your team or your teams and your team's age compared to teams of a similar age. Now, if your team's only doing this for a year, you want to be able to compare it to like teams. So we compare teams to similar teams of a similar age. And lastly, a forecast model, including cost savings, which we've been able to model, risk profile, ability to pivot, psychological safety, and other kinds of, um, of outcomes. So I'm just going to talk you through some of the longitudinal studies that we've done on some of the teams, as Matthew mentioned, we've been following these teams for about four to five years as we've been developing the model. Um, and that's very interesting data that we started to see. What we found as their, over time, um, as their agile IQ increased, um, which is their maturity, we actually found that the number of times that they needed to do overtime decreased. So they were actually getting more efficient at what they were doing and didn't need to do that rush at the end before a release to do overtime to get it over the line or to do more overtime at the end of a sprint to finish everything off. When we looked at the predictive analytics, we also saw that um, in addition to that decrease in overtime, we were also seeing a decrease in defects and rework um, as their Agile IQ maturity increased. So you can see at about the 80 um, Agile IQ, we've got quite a lot of defects. We've got teams that are quite mature with an Agile IQ of 140 to 180 with almost getting down to zero defects in any of their releases. And the Agile IQ, very similar to um, normal IQ, it's on a scale of one to 200. So you can see those teams that are performing really well have that IQ from 160 to 180, and they're our very high performing teams that we could see. So we were seeing a decrease in overtime and a decrease in defects. What that translated to was actually cost savings per team per month. So we did the modeling based on a team of 10 people and we were able to show those particular organizations that we were working with that just by looking at those decreases and that agile IQ increase in maturity, they were saving themselves up to 40 to $50,000 per month. And that meant that they were able to be more efficient at what they were doing, get more features out the door. Um, as I mentioned, we looked at these teams over a number of years and some of them we were able to sort of see when we were getting that significant approval uh, improvement. When I'm an Agile coach and I go in and work with an organisation, I'm often told, oh, well, how long is it going to take for this Agile transformation or how long is it going to take before my teams are up and running? Most of you who are uh, working in Agile, you'll know that within sort of three to six months, you're seeing quite good improvement. And that's what we saw in our data too. At about that six month mark, teams had quite significant improvements um, and got to um, you know, stage two in their Agile IQ status. We found that they continued to increase over time. There was a time around about the three year mark that we saw a bit of a dip. So we looked into this to see what was causing that slight decrease. What we found that was that we had pretty stable teams, but about that three year mark was when people either moved to new roles or we had some changes. We also saw that there was a bit of complacency in their practice had set in. 
Um, and we found that around about the four to five year market started to recover again. So it just shows that when you make those significant changes, we also found that at that three-year mark, a lot of the scrum masters that we'd been working with from the initial stages had all been promoted. So about 30% of our original scrum masters got promoted. So it soon became the thing to get on the agile trains because that way you get promoted. So that was kind of a different offshoot of the data that we weren't expecting either. So that dip at three years was also part of our success that people got promoted and moved to other teams. We found that with an Agile IQ at about 80 at that three month mark, when you get up to an Agile IQ of about 130, we saw that around the one year mark, this is really where teams have that true ability to pivot really quickly if there's a big change. We've all gone through COVID and the pandemic and we're still going through it. And we did a lot of this analysis, particularly when the pandemic hit, to see which teams we felt would be okay. And we were able to use this data to talk to the executive and management level about which teams were an agile IQ where we felt they would be okay and they maintain their effectiveness and which ones were a little bit lower that might need some more support from management when we went to um, uh, remote working. And we found that these findings were replicated in industry research. So we were um, very, interested to see that the more self-managing the teams are, the more effective they are, the more faster decision-making, increased productivity, higher quality, they achieve their goals, feel more useful, feel more challenged, and there's a lot um, more trust within the team and the team members. We also looked at the industry research, at, um, particularly in the behavioural area, and we saw a really strong alignment to that um, industry research, particularly um, Google's uh, Project Aristotle, which was all about team effectiveness, Amy Edmondson's um, work on psychological safety, Scrum.org has a um, competency model that we also compared it to, as well as some of the Bain and Co research. So we found that there was quite a lot of robust um, robustness to the findings that we were finding with what the industry were finding in their research as well. And recently we started to notice um, as, uh, as COVID hit and in Australia we had uh, lock, we went into lockdown and then came out of lockdown and in and out. We found that um, Agile IQ was a really great predictor of organisational resilience. We saw organisations that um, were more prone, had managers that were more prone to go into crisis management we saw Agile IQ go down and then when the, everyone came back in the office and they thought, oh, well, good, I can get back to self-organisation and self-managing, then their Agile IQ would go up. And that up and down actually decreased their ability, their ability to pivot, whereas some organisations that had a much higher Agile IQ were much more resilient. We saw managers uh, less prone to, um, to crisis management and just simply continued supporting their staff as they as they started to work from home and do, do remote work. We saw their Agile IQ pretty much maintain um, a, a steady um, a steady rate across the three, six, 12 months that they're in lockdown. So you've got the results, what now? Well, with, um, with our clients, what we've noticed is that there are, there are five discrete sets of behaviours um, that represent certain types of uh, agile mindset as well as certain types of agile behaviors. And it's for each of those that we then have um, looked at the kinds of practices that help teams get beyond from one stage to the next stage that we started to find good, strong correlations with. So for example, for, for a stage two team, if they work on self-management, we find that they move into, into stage three, that their, their ability to pivot improves, their risk decreases, their ability to be uh, their more they're more effective as teams, et cetera. Um, and so for each of these stages, we compared um, their Agile IQ to teams of a similar age. And based on those sets of things we're able to provide through AI, recommendations to, uh, for that team in that stage at that time to improve, um, to help focus on behaviours to encourage and help uh, re regarding what kinds of principles and practices to adopt. So for a stage one team, the kinds of behaviours that we saw ultimately were um, teams in stage one kind of only really typically at the, the start of their journey. They're thinking about agile, they're kind of tweaking a few things. Anti patterns that we saw with uh, teams at this particular stage are things like cargo cult, managers tending to be micromanagement, um, 
some some cultural resistance, phrases like, oh, but, but we deliver, so, you know, so why should we change? Um, key to growth at a stage one were for, we found were for managers to set expectations about a framework to adopt, set the guardrails in essence, to lead by example, and importantly treat agile as behavioral change, not as a methodology to implement. We found that this also aligned with Wastefizz's uh, model for organizational culture. The, the, the symbols and basic behaviors, these are the easiest things to change. And that teams that were involved uh, but kind of stuck in stage one had really strong in relation to this, but nothing further. They didn't have, for, for example, scalability, minimizing waste, great transparency, systems thinking, et cetera. Because these we found were the types of behavioral traits that were more attached to stages two, three, and four and onwards. So for stage two, stage two teams, we found uh, good baseline practices, commitment to actually changing the way that they're working, not just tweaking around the edges. Any patterns for teams in, in stage two, typically water scrum fall or hybrid, they're kind of still trapped in a project management mindset. And it wasn't until teams actually started to give up those, that kind of way of thinking and moving to agile product management that we started to see them shift um, out of stage two. Realistically, this actually aligns really strongly with uh, Dunning and Kruger effect, where we see teams as their, their competence and their experience. Uh, for stage one and two, they, certain, they, they get to a certain point and they, their confidence is really awesome. They go, wow, we're agile teams. We've got lots of symbols of agile, but realistically, unless they actually made the behavioral shift to sort of organization and agile product management, they started to use impact and outcome metrics, particularly from frameworks like evidence-based management, they got stuck in stage two. For teams that actually could make it through to stage five, we saw them get out of the other side of the Dunning-Kruger curve and actually have really, really strong agile outcomes. So for stage three, um, the strongest behaviors here, agile product management, customer mindset, strong empiricism. For stage four teams, we saw teams, as they started to adapt, lean and flow metrics on top of typically Scrum. And as they started to implement Agile OKRs uh, or evidence-based management, these were teams that started to thrive and started to get become hyper-productive. Um, key to stage four teams actually growing was systems thinking, actually understanding that like they're not the, the be on end all of, of, a, of a system of people, process and tools, particularly at scale, as they started to support other teams and take a leadership perspective, we start to see th those teams um, have really, really strong um, e exemplified leadership behavior. These, these were teams and these were scrum masters, really trained engineers um, that be became uh, leaders for communities of practice around, around agility. And of course, for them, key to sustaining that growth was for management to provide them leadership opportunities. So today we, with our client that asked this question, well, how do I measure it? This is what we're doing. We ended up developing an app because for me spending all this time actually doing manual a statistical analysis in Excel takes a long time. So we developed an app. You can put in, we're able to put in our team information, give this to our consultants and to our clients. They enter in those, um, those snapshots of who's doing the analysis uh, and the assessment of what the team profile look like, et cetera. They can do a quick um, or a full baseline assessment answer those questions. And for an 85 uh, question baseline, typically you do that first, that can take you about 20, 30 minutes. After that, 15 questions is all that you need to in order to adjust the baseline. That then gives you a result of roughly where you are, compares you to teams of a similar age and breaks it down by those four um, behavioral elements of self-organization and agile values, as well as deconstruction into its sub factors. From that, we've been able to set goals in order to improve those those things, and then based on the stage, um, attach um, coaching recommendations essentially to teams at that stage to help them move through to um, the following stage. And we've got a, a dashboard now that then helps us actually provide a much bigger, basically a big picture view of how the teams themselves are performing, um, how, what are the, because we're comparing behavior. So much easier to compare as a result, the strength of those behaviors, we can do that. Um, across an agile release trainer program. We can also compare um, the average of that program or release train to the average of other release trains that we've done because maybe we've got longitudinal data in some instances that span five years. Um, we can throw in that behavioral um, strengths into modeling to show forecast 
uh, modelled cost savings, as well as elements of delivery, uh, delivery effectiveness. So some final thoughts. The, the traditional metrics are great. They're a really, really good way to understand what has occurred. Burn up, burn down, defect stories, completed cumulative flow in velocity. But because we can measure behaviour, what we need is some kind of model then to go in order to answer some of these questions around uh, why are some teams more agile than others? Why are they more successful? What can help make teams more agile? What uh, recommended actions are going to provide teams with the ability to help this to be um, their outcomes and their impacts to be repeatable and scalable? We need data models, and that's where we've gone with um, with our Agile IQ tool that we've been using quite extensively now with a lot of our clients. Um, it, we're able to collect data, put it into the model, and provide some really deep insights into what are their um, uh, what are the strengths of them, some of these behaviours. And the implications for leadership and executive are really quite interesting. It means that to actually, if you want these kinds of outcomes, if you want to deliver true value in terms of um, improved experiences, improved products, um, a greater experience with products, improving share price, improving internal capability as well, developing in product, agile product management into new, um, into new products, or how do I support existing products to be even better? To get those kind of enterprise outcomes, managers have to mod the data model shows as reinforced by the, the literature and the science of it's nearly three, four, five decades old. We know that um, traditional manager led is less effective than in terms of particularly in terms of productivity um, to self-managing product teams. So this, that shift increases agility. We know that uh, to promote agile values and to, for managers to lead by example is an important aspect of that. To be value-driven, prioritise work by value, decentralised decision, decision making, these things contribute to agile values. For, for sprinting, you know, our model showed that only 10% of the structure of, of, your, of your agility contributes to agile outcomes. There's still a significant part of it. It means short work cycles, sprinting essentially, inspection and adaptation, applying empiricism, particularly from Scrum works really well. Lot, small, long-lived teams, not project teams, not assembling teams and disassembling them, but forming them and keeping them together. Some of our data shows it takes about three months for, uh, for a team to learn how to work together. Why would you then get to the end of the project and disassemble them and put them on something else? So keeping the team together, and as we often say with our clients, moving the work to the team, as opposed to putting individuals and giving them tasks and putting individuals on, on projects. Remember, pro, uh, agile product management was one of the key things to, to accelerate, based on the model, accelerate um, uh, business agility from stage three and onwards. And of course, a commitment to producing a continuous learning culture. Continuous learning helps, helps teams get out of that Dunning-Kruger effect of, oh, we're awesome. And so as soon as they start to open up and learn that just because they can sprint isn't the be all and end all of Agile or that you no know, Kanban isn't just visualization, it's limiting work in, in, in progress, it's putting in, in, in flow metrics. Um, those kinds of learnings help teams to understand that just implementing Scrum or visualizing work is not the end point. And, Management supporting that helps to actually push that a bit further. Those four, the strength of those four combined, um, the model shows, as does the um, as does the literature research shows that these four um, are able to predict improvements in productivity and lower costs and lower risk in terms of delivery. So for leaders, if you're a scrum master, a product owner, a release trained engineer. All of these, these elements mean that don't treat agile, agile ways of working as kind of a second figure. We implement a methodology and we're done. Um, and stay away from measuring just activity. We're going to move beyond that. And that's what the data model shows. That do treat agile as a change in the way that people work, the way that they think about work and the way that they behave in work as well. And measure the behavior, behavior you're, you're 
the strength of the behavior is gonna be your best predictor of capability and growing capability in business agility and getting these strong outcomes of faster pivot, lower costs, and decreased risks. For those of you who are interested in the white paper that we co-authored with scrum.org, um, if you go to agileiq.com and go under how it works, you'll find the white paper, or you can, you can search scrum.org, um, uh, Agile IQ, you'll also find it on, on their website. You can go to agile.com and we've made this publicly available now. You can get a 45 day free trial where you can um, uh, start to add in teams and do, do assessments and see the comparisons of your teams versus others based on the strength of their behavior. And if you, you want to download do it in the app store as well as the um, iOS store, so the Apple store, so you can pop it on your mobile and have a play with it if you'd like. And we, find, we found that for our, for our coaches in particular, having it on your mobile phone and being able to go to a team and kind of take your assessment tool with you instead of being stuck at a computer was one of the easiest ways to be able to, to carry out team assessments. For some, uh, for some Scrum Masters, for example, meant that they could do it themselves with just having a phone by themselves and either screen, screencasting the questions up onto, up onto a TV or just answering, um, uh, reading off the questions themselves. So if you're interested in subscription, 20% off if you use this code. And of course, happy to do a demo to kind of walk you through these things. So um, send an email to support at Agile IQ and I'd uh, love to have a chat. Um, I think we're done. We're kind of on 36 minutes. Time for questions, I guess. Yeah. Thanks, Mia. Thanks, Matthew. It was very impressive. And then you could see the comments also in the chat. People are very impressed. Mia has answered a couple of questions already, and there are still yeah. four more. Uh, so, do you want to take it right now? We have some. Time. Yeah, I'll just I'll just summarize a couple of things. So, Matt said that you know when we did the algorithm we, to prevent Dunning Kruger, we actually ask the person who's doing the assessment a few questions. Um, we do look at certifications, and uh, Matt did mention CSM. He wasn't saying that CSM isn't a good cert because um, we actually uh, have many of our colleagues who do those certifications. What we're saying is that the AI looks at, oh, you've also got a CSMP, you're a practitioner, so you progress and you've got lifelong learning. So we were looking at people, if they went beyond just that first cert and then went to the more advanced cert and got advanced Scrum Master and so forth, the AI gives you more weighting as being more experienced. We also looked at your level of experience and knowledge, not just certifications. So there are a few questions that we ask in the beginning. Um, the other question they're asking for is, it's not working when they go to agileiq.com. So if you put in zen uh, zenxmachina.com, um, agile, so www.agileiq.com, it will work. You've just got to put the www in front of it. So sorry about that, but yes, you can get there or you can get to it from the Zenex Machina website. Um, people took lots of screenshots, that's great. We will make the presentation available to you. We're data nerds, so we'd love to talk about data all day. So we will hang around and be in the um, Hangouts. We'd love you to come and join us, um, but happy to take any, oh, there's lots of things in the QA, so we probably should address those, Matt. Yeah. So sustainable work for teams is another measure. Was that considered? So that Stop. was, yeah. So we looked at sustainable pace as in the decrease in overtime as one of one measure of were people working sustainably rather than doing hero work. Did you have any yeah, other so comments on that, Matt? Well, if that's some of the questions. So remember some of the questions we took out of the Adam Manifesto and certainly working at a sustainable pace is one of those key questions. Once we put all those questions into the data model, what we were looking for was clusters of questions that showed us that there was an emerging factor. So things like, um, let me see, see um, uh, optimizing for flow, um, managing products with agility, um, smaller work batches, dependability, uh, a number of uh, questions um, manifested themselves in these kinds of factors. Um, okay. You said it's not a survey where teams self-assess. Yeah, so how do you get, gather the data? the data? You literally go on your phone and based on your profile, because now we've got a data model, uh, remember the data model is based on an expert assessment. 
So we uh, meant that the reliability and repeatability and inter-rater reliability was very, very high. So when you uh, first do an assessment, um, so we don't, it's not a, you know, a, a whole team um, it fills out a survey. It's a one person needs to, to, to do the assessment. You could do that in, in a retrospective and simply read off the questions off your phone, or you can also do it via the web portal. You, you could read the questions off and have a conversation and come up with a collective response as to, you know, is it based on statements that strongly agree or strongly disagree with that particular statement? Um, so it's uh, based on those, that all, all then goes into the, uh, into the data model. Remember, it looks at your team profile, your, uh, the assessor's profile, as well as the questions. Those are inputs into the data model. And then it will then show you those, the strength of um, the behaviour against those four factors. And there's 23 sub-factors, I think, in, in total, shows the improvements in something. And the input from the team, if you want to gather that. So we asked the scrum master or the agile coach working with the team to do the that first initial baseline assessment. But then because once you've done that baseline, the next lot you only need to do 15 questions. Sometimes you can use that in a retrospective and you can share screen and the team can put that together. That's I've seen um, teams use that as a retrospective pattern. We also have scrum masters using it quite regularly as well. Recent case studies during this time. Um, yes, we've continued to work with a lot of teams and gathering data um, during COVID and getting some really interesting statistics on team effectiveness. That's really leveraging off the Google Aristotle work. Um, so maybe that's our white paper part two, where we talk about the more recent um, case studies, but um, we will try and, and share those as we've got them as well. Yeah, we're continuing to collect data and analyze the, 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 the data and see what it tells us. Um, someone uh, has mentioned um, expert fallacy. How did we comp compensate for that? Um, that was actually quite simple. We looked at inter-rater reliability. Um, so we had some teams that were assessed by, so the same team assessed by different assessors and then com compared. Um, we and, and what we found out was pretty early on that by adjusting some of the questions, putting in a lie scale as well, which is hidden inside the, the, the data model. There are many aspects that, um, and the AI helps as well, to be able to assess how does the individual actually respond? Is there a halo effect go, go, going on, for, for example? We looked at correlations but between people who have things like um, a PST, because we had several PSTs doing this assessment. So that's a peer reviewed assessment. So their level of, of, of knowledge has been peer reviewed and experience has been peer reviewed. So we compared different raters to that level and the data model is able to adequately compensate for, um, for a number of those cognitive biases as a result. We also had a lot of teams at scale. So if they were an SPC um, or they're a SPC trainer or a CST, they were weighted higher as well because we've got a number of CSTs that have helped us test this as well. So we were looking at all of those things. Um, in the q and I'll just go back to that. How many organisations are using Agile IQ at this point? Um, look, I know it's over 100, but I don't have the exact figure. Um, but we're getting subscription. We've only just gone live on the App Store about two months ago. Um, before that, it was um, uh, used just through some people that were helping us uh, test it over the last um, couple of years. But yes, we've got over 100 people that are actively using Agile IQ at the moment. Yep. And most of them are quite large organisations because they're the ones that are trying to sort of save the costs of Agile coaching. And I guess we're doing ourselves out of a job by using Agile IQ, but they're wanting to sort of have coaches in there initially, but then they want the teams to be self-sustaining and Agile IQ is almost their coach in a pocket that they can use to help them with those tips and tricks. And then the coach goes back and does pulse checks and health checks um, further down the track to just see how they're going. Um, changing the manager's belief, um, Chandon had in the Q&A as well. Um, how do we change the, the managers thinking about just velocity, bugs and et cetera? That is um, working with the leadership and it is training and mentoring and coaching. 
um, that leadership team. And we always make sure that any of the transformations that we're doing, and I know a lot of my colleagues do this as well, um, that they start with that leadership because they are so critical to understanding that metrics need to be outcomes. And it's the language that they talk all the time. We don't talk to them about um, velocity. What they want to know is, am I going to get return on in my investment? Is my market share going to get up? Have I got customers that are using more of this stuff? So they naturally understand outcome metrics rather than activity metrics. It's just about having the discussion with them. I know we've got four minutes to go and I'm trying to get through as many questions as I can. Um, how will it help lowering costs? Maybe that's one for you, Matt. Yeah, so a lot, what we found was that as Agile IQ got higher, um, defects went down. And that meant the teams weren't spending so much time um, addressing issues with their product. And so that so, so they finished early. Essentially, that they were delivering more with less. So um, the amount that it cost to deliver the same features went down, you know, that they weren't doing feature development and then bug fixes. So the, amount, so the amount of time to deliver decreased. That meant the amount of invested time to deliver a feature went down, hence cost savings. So, um, and the mean time to repair also went down as well. So we looked at some of those other metrics, yeah. yeah. Can we show some sample reports? No, because that's commercial in confidence with our clients. And I've done my best to, to de-identify um, yeah. because what I've just shown you in terms of some of those graphs, that's actual data from Agile IQ. Why is Agile IQ Once you do, oh, sorry, just what on the reports, once you do your team assessment, if you want to download and get the free trial, it automatically, when you press finish assessment, it says print to PDF and you actually get your report straight away um, in real time. So you'll actually get a PDF of the assessment you do and it'll show you what your stage is, how you compare to other teams of a similar age and what particular areas um, your team could work on. And you can also set yourself some improvement goals in the app as well and track it. So it's almost like a Fitbit for your Agile team. You can keep looking at that every day if you wanted to. <laughs> Do we have uh, questions related to technical agility? Um, so we're, what we're after is the behaviours, not specific types of practices, although there are those kinds of questions in the in the full 85 questions that are around um, uh, um, uh, so some of them are from extreme programming so what we're after is we know that TDD and BDD great practices what what's the mindset behind those and what does it lead to and that's then manifested in let me see one of these sub factors <laughs> um, no, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it is uh, it does manifest itself in, in one of the sub factors in particular. And the final question, how to get to speed again when a new team member joins a team, people leave and so forth. In our longitudinal data and also in the project board that Matthew showed in the slides, when we had any change in teams, it does take them at least three sprints to recover. Some of them it will take three to six months. So that's why long-lived teams and being very wary of making those changes too frequently um, is very important to consider because there is that time to recover. I think we've covered as many as we could. <laughs> yes, Mia. Thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Mia. It was a very, very interesting session, impressive, and uh, it gave a different perspective for all of us.